So as I say, today we've got a presentation, hopefully it'll be about half an hour to 45 minutes, depending on how long I can talk. And any of you that have met me before will know that I can talk quite a lot. Um, so we'll have um, opportunity for questions afterwards. Um, there's a Q&A function, so please just fire them in. Um, so just a quick um, bit of information about us. Um, so we're Cycle Law Scotland. We're the only um, specialist um, cycling lawyers in Scotland and we represent cyclists that have been involved in accidents. And we're cyclists ourselves and we think that that makes all the difference. Um, we're different types of cyclists amongst us. Um, uh, we've got road cycling, Rod and uh, our senior partner Brenda, that's, um, there's a picture of them in their um, on their tandem so their marriage must be fairly strong to to get away with that i don't think my marriage would survive a tandem ride um and we've got thomas here who's um an enduro mountain biker as well um i'm primarily um a road cyclist um, i do dabble in the odd tt or triathlon um but here's me being captured at the worst possible moment as always by the photographer at these sportives um so uh, you'll see me descending when i'm not i should be on the drops and i'm not and here's me um, wide open like a gate when I, again i should be on the drops as well um but as i say we do think it makes all the difference that we are um cyclists ourselves because we know what it's like out there and we know some of the hazards that you come across on the road so Paul of shame, some of the things that I'm going to be talking about today, potholes, potholes are the worst, um, and that's something I'm going to be talking about. Um, you often have things like, um, you know, the, these expansion joints on, on roads that can cause real issues, particularly to cyclists, and perhaps not so much as to motorists, and a little bit about cycle paths as well. Um, but first, um, I have to start with a little legal lesson, so bear with me while I set out the, the basis of how we work. Um, so we're a firm of lawyers, um, but we're civil lawyers, and civil law is a law between people. So uh, as personal injury civil lawyers, we're involved in proving negligence um, or breach of duty on the, uh, on the part of another person that's led to uh, an injury um, and damage to our client. So it's a distinct area of law to criminal law, um, which you'll often find that the police and the procurator fiscal are involved in. Um, now, particularly with cycling accidents, there can be a bit of crossover between criminal law and civil law. And quite often um, accidents that were involved in representing our client's civil rights, so there will also be a criminal aspect of it. But we are involved in, in civil law and the burden of proof on that is on the balance of probabilities. So the starting point for any um, civil claim for compensation is the duty of care. And we have to be able to prove that there's a duty of care owed by one person to the other, that that, that, that duty has been breached and that breach has led to um, loss, injury and damage. So it's the, the sort of three points um, that we have to be able to prove in order to, to make a successful claim for compensation. Now, in the vast majority of cases that we deal with are collisions between road users and uh, the duty of care there is obvious as we all owe a duty of care to other road users um, and we're obliged to exercise reasonable care um, to other people around us on the road. However, it's a bit more different when we're looking at road surface defects or hazards on the road. So for incidents involving those surface defects or hazards, we're looking usually at the roads authority that are responsible. And the roads authority is, again, usually the, um, the local authority, i.e. the council, or in terms of the trunk road network, um, it's Transport Scotland for the, the, the Scottish ministers who are responsible for maintaining this about 2000 miles of um, trunk roads in Scotland. And the basis for that is the Road Scotland Act, which says that the local authority um, or the Secretary of State for Transport Scotland shall maintain the roads in their area. So they're responsible for, um, for maintaining the roads and that includes inspecting them and responding to hazards. So one of the first things that I'm going to talk about is potholes, because I know that that's something certainly that affects me an awful lot um, in terms of when I go out cycling. In fact, I just ripped um, one of my brand new tires yesterday, um, which I wasn't very happy about on a pothole. And um, it really is the bane of all cyclists um, trying to dodge them 
And when you can't dodge them, um, they can cause damage or um, worse injury. So for potholes, the roads authority are obliged to maintain and manage the roads in their area. And this will include a reasonable inspection regime and reporting to um, reports of defects on the roads. So the council are obliged to inspect their roads on a reasonable frequency, depending on um, where the road fits into the hierarchy. So the more popular routes would be expected to be inspected more frequently than the lesser used roads. And the inspections should um, assess the road surface for defects and the defects should be assessed for how serious they are and scheduled for repair again based on how serious they are. Um, now, this is a tweet from, it's actually Cheshire West Council and they were as part of a social media campaign trying to set out about how they do their inspections and you'll see that this is Darren. Uh, from Cheshire West Council and he's sort of showing us how he inspects potholes and th they gather quite a lot of attention for this tweet because Darren's measuring this pothole from basically inside the pothole he's standing in the pothole trying to measure it and he's saying that it's under 50 millimeters and therefore no, no action needs to be taken again if it's under 50 millimeters he's actually just standing directly in it so he's not really measuring it so perhaps they should have gone spec savers and put his glasses on there um, before actually measuring it so there was lots of memes that came out about after that. So Darren says it's fine. So the council should identify faults from their inspection, but they should also respond, respond to reports of defects that might be made from the police or from members of the public. And the second one is important because often you'll know on your regular routes, if you go out on the bike regularly, you'll know the potholes to avoid. Um, but it's one thing being aware of them and knowing that you can avoid them. But it's important if you can to report each pothole that you find that's a danger to the council um, to, so that they can be aware of it and hopefully it can be res um, responded to and repaired so somebody doesn't have an accident on it. You can normally report um, via your local authority area um, on their website. So they'll have a reporting uh, pothole or road defects function and it's worthwhile doing that. Um, there's also websites like fillthathole.org.uk. Now type that one in very carefully because if you type .com, it's an entirely different type of website. Um, so if you go to fillthathole.org.uk and you can um, specify exactly where a pothole is and they will send um, a report to the relevant local authority on your behalf. And it's worthwhile doing that. And it's really satisfying, in fact, when you're the next time you go out on your bike and then you, you realise that it's been repaired and it was yourself that you know, made that report and it's been repaired. Um, so in terms of pothole cases, they are certainly amongst the more difficult that we deal with because it's not enough for us to be able to show that, that pothole existed. That's the easy part. And we have to be able to show that the council or the roads authority knew or ought to have known that the pothole was there and ought to have done something about it prior to the accident. So often what a lot of our job is, is to try and gather the information about how long the pothole had been there for. And usually our client isn't able to say, say because if they knew the pothole was there, then they wouldn't have gone into it. But if we're able to gather information um, about how long the pothole had been there and when the council ought to have noted it and done something about it. And some of the ways that we can do that is by doing freedom of information requests to see recent inspection records and the maintenance records from the road. Um, we can contact local householders or business owners to, who might be able to speak to how long the pothole had been there for. And we can um, instruct highways maintenance experts to review the evidence and provide a review on what a reasonable roads authority ought to have done in the circumstances. And all of this is really necessary for us to be able to prove a case. So I'm not sure if that video is going to work. Well, that's a shame. Oh, here we go. Um, so I wanted to give you um, and I'll hopefully be able to play this again. This is a real live case that we dealt with. And this is my client's head cam. Oh, there he goes. I'll see if I can play that again. Let's see. Um, there we go.
Um, so this is a real case that we dealt with. My client was cycling along and this is the A8, um, which is one of the feeder roads onto the M8 um, near Bishopton. And what he thought was a puddle ended up being a huge pothole. It was two and a half metres long, a metre and a half wide and 15 centimetres deep. And the reason why he didn't see it, as you can see on that, that video, is it was filled with water. There's oncoming traffic on the other way, so he couldn't swerve um, to avoid what he thought was a puddle and ended up going straight into it and was injured. Um, so although we had that video footage and he then went back later in order to um, you know, take further photographs and measurements of the pothole, it wasn't enough for us to be able to show that the pothole existed. What we had to do in that case is to find out about when the council ought to have known it was there and when they ought to have done something about it. So this was Renfrew Shire Council. And what we did is we carried out freedom of information requests to find out what the inspection regime for the area was. And we found that the, the road was subject to monthly inspections. And as it turns out, the road was actually inspected just three days before the accident. We later found out through further information requests that the reason for the pothole existing was that there was a slow leaking burst water main underneath the road which was causing um, the, the, the ground underneath to, to subside. And then the road basically caved in. We had to instruct a highways experts, um, so a roads expert to provide us with a report about the, the accident to tell us um, how long he thought that that pothole had been there for and whether it ought to have been noted by the council in their inspection just three days prior. And what our expert was able to say is that because of the slow build nature of the leak of the um, water mains underneath, it was unlikely that that was a pothole that appeared overnight. That was something that was going to have been there for weeks. And with the council having investigated and inspected the road just three days prior, it ought to have been there, um, ought to have been there to be seen. Um, so accordingly, that case was actually not based on, again, just the pothole existing, but the, the negligence there was based on the fact that the pothole ought to have been noted by the uh, reasonable inspection by the council, which was carried out just three days before. Um, this is another case that I dealt with involving potholes. Um, and this is my client, Tina, who's a keen road cyclist. And she was out in a training ride um, with her partner. She was cycling in front, and this is near Temple in Midlothian. Um, it's near, uh, I think it's the Gladstone Reservoir, it's called. Um, and um, it's a terrible bit of road, and it's like this all the way along. And she's trying to pick her way through the potholes um, to, to find a route. And she picks her way through some potholes and eventually ends up in this huge crater. She comes off, off her bike, um, injuring her shoulder. We intimated the claim to Midlothian Council, who were the responsible roads authority. And they, say, uh, they came back saying that they're sorry, that they knew that the road was bad and they'd spotted it before, but they had actually repaired it two weeks later, as in two weeks before the accident. Now, we knew that this wasn't the case because first of all, we had these photographs from the time of the accident. And we also had her boyfriend who had gone out on his bicycle a number of weeks later to take some more photographs and some more measurements. And when he was there, he actually found that the road, um, the roads workers were repairing the pothole at the time he was there and took photographs of them doing so. So whether or not it was um, the council had made a recording error on when the pothole had been repaired or whether they had uh, sought to wholly mislead us. Um, well, I suppose we'll never know. Um, but quite quickly after it was pointed out that the, the area hadn't been repaired because we had timestamps photographs of the, the road workers actually repairing the road, um, they were um, quickly caved in and made a settlement of the case. Um, so as I say, potholes are difficult cases, um, it's not enough to show that the pothole exists, um, although it's really important um, that if you are involved in an accident um, caused by a pothole, do try and take photographs of it and any measurements you can. I appreciate you probably don't carry a ruler about with you and I'd probably judge you if you did, but um, 
taking something beside it for scale, perhaps a coin, your keys, whatever, is really helpful. And um, particularly because um, if it's later repaired, it can be difficult to show how big the pothole was. Um, I wanted to talk next about um, railway cross crossings. And again, this is a real case that we dealt with. So it's a level crossing in Carnoustie. Um, and my client was cycling a long station road. So she was cycling this direction. And at the end, there's a T-junction and she was going to be turning right. So she's cycling away from the camera here and she's going to be turning right. Um, she's aware, of course, because you can't miss it, that she was crossing um, a, a level crossing. And she knew that she wanted to try and cross the tracks at a right angle, which is the correct thing to do. What she hadn't spotted um, is right here is a tiny blue cyclist dismount sign, um, which in our opinion was far too close um, to uh, the actual crossing to actually give her any warning or opportunity to do anything about it. And in any event, she's got traffic coming this way, traffic behind her. There's no opportunity for her to dismount. In any event, she didn't see the sign and she was proceeding across the, um, the, the level crossing. And again, we've got a video of what happened to her. It's not a great quality, but I'll show it all the same if I can get it to play. Is this gonna work? Nope. My apologies, it works on rehearsal. Oh, here we go. Yeah, there's down the bottom the left hand side, is it? I'm on it. I've got it. Oh. So she, com <laughs> she comes directly off. And uh, she's on the ground. She hurts her shoulder. She hurts her wrists. Both thighs are, are, are sort of because she goes directly over the handlebars. Um, and she's not sure exactly what caused it to happen. I'll start again because it comes so suddenly. I'll see if I can get it to work again. So here she is cycling along, approaching, trying to cross at right angles, also get towards the right hand side and she's straight off. And only afterwards does she find out. I'll get the next slide. That what had happened is that there was, although she managed to cross the level crossings at exactly right angles as she ought to have done, her front tire has slipped in between these flangeway mats and it's this rubber matting. Um, and the flangeway mats had come apart um, with this perfect uh, 23 millimeter um, road bike sized gap in the middle. And her front tire had become wedged in that and she'd come straight over the handlebars. So she was really concerned that other cyclists might have the same problem. Um, so there's, this is actually a staffed level, level crossing. So whenever it's in operation, um, I'll go back. Um, right here, that's, um, that's staffed by a level crossing operator. So there's somebody there all day, every day, um, you know, looking after the level crossing. Um, apparently, the, the station, well, that's really the station master, the, the crossing master um, stuck his head out the window and asked if she was okay, but that was that. There was, there was no other assistance given to her and she had to limp home. Um, so what we were able to find out from Freedom of Information requests to Network Rail, who were responsible for the level crossing. So for here, it wasn't actually the roads authority, it was Network Rail who were responsible for the, the level crossing as, as part of the railway network, is that they knew that there was problems with these gaps appearing between these mats. And they knew that, the, that this could cause um, hazards to cyclists. And also perhaps more concerningly, they, they acknowledged that this could cause problems to people crossing with buggies um, and prams as well. So you would hate to think of, you know, sort of a buggy or pram getting stuck on a level crossing here. So they knew that there was this problem, but didn't actually seem to do anything about it. Considering that, um, and, and these mats can be easily sort of pulled together. They've got special hooks that they can use and just, they just sort of nudge them together. It's not, it's not a big job. It's just something that can be done in just, just a few seconds. And the level crossing again is man's, so there's no particular reason why somebody couldn't go out, check the mats every day, make sure there's no gaps. And if there was a gap, just get the hook and drag the, the mats along. 
Um, but instead, network rail did nothing. Um, and this led to my client's accident. So on the back of this information, we intimated the claim to network rail, who denied responsibility entirely on the basis of the cyclist dismount sign. And they said that she should never have been on the, the railway tracks because of the cyclist dismount sign. However, this is a blue rectangular cyclist dismount sign, and it's advisory only. And the reason for that, those signs is for the, the risk of crossing the railway tracks. And it didn't actually warn of the risk that the Teller client, which was this you know, gap, in the, gap in the flangeway mat. Once we pointed all this out to, to Network Rail, um, eventually they admitted responsibility and um, because we were threatening to raise court action, but they did make a full settlement to our client. But again, sort of running back to a, a common thread is it's not the presence of the hazard itself that won the case. That, those bits tend to be the easy bits to prove. It's gathering the evidence of what the duty holder should have known and what they ought to have done about it. Um, so in, in this particular case, the requesting information, we were able to show that they, they knew about this hazard of the gaps and we, we could easily allege uh, and make allegations that it was easy for them to do something about it. So we've talked a lot mostly about, um, or I've talked um, mostly about road surfaces, um, but equally there's quite a lot a lot of cycle paths now and they're very much more in use particularly during the pandemic and there's been an explosion in cycling which is great um, but a lot of new cyclists are not keen to go out in routes, uh, routes on the road and would prefer to stick to cycle paths um, so again this is a case that we dealt with a number of years ago um, and we can also assess when your accident was not on the road and it was involving a cycle path and our client here was using the cycle path at Craig Leith, um, Edinburgh, and was heading out towards Rose Roseburn. And there'd been recent resurfacing works on the cycle path, including the application of this jaunty beige anti-skid surface. So this was meant to make things grippier for cyclists. Um, and I think we've got, no, it's not gonna work. Um, it's just a video showing it, but it runs the whole length. Um, of the cycle path, this the anti skid surface. Just hit the so return key, Rose. It should just come on if you just move on. Slightly. Anything could happen if I hit the return key. Oh no, there we go. Um, so presumably, the council thought they were doing something good for the cyclists by by installing this um, on the the main cycle path. Um, however, our client um, went onto the cycle path and all of a sudden his bike went from underneath him and when the surface was wet. And the, the surface that they applied actually became slippier than normal tarmac when it was wet. Um, what we did is it, uh, this client had contacted us um, to ask for our advice because typical cyclist, he was more concerned with his bike and his damaged kit um, than himself. Um, even though he had been injured. Um, when we intimated the claim to the City of Edinburgh Council, um, they considered that the surface fell within the acceptable tolerances, um, but um, there was, and they denied that there was any um, problems with the surface, uh, which had been applied specifically to be anti-skid. So we submitted a freedom of information request to the council, um, but we were, initially denied any information about um, the, the road surface and they refused our request on the, on the grounds that it would substantially prejudice the course of justice, which of course it would for them. Um, we ended up having to appeal to the Information Commissioner's Office, who's the, the body that deals with disputes re relating to the freedom of information requests, who forced the council to uh, release the information to us. And of course, the information showed that there'd been a number of cyclists that had reported slipping accidents on this road surface prior to our client having his accident. So our client wasn't the first um, accident involving a cyclist on the surface, and it wasn't the first one that the, the council knew about. It. Other cyclists had fallen from their bikes and reported it to the council. Um, so after we pointed this out, um, we were able to negotiate a settlement um, for our clients um, that he was very delighted with and we were glad to be able to help. So again, it's really important 
if you have had an accident, um, even if you're not intending or you're not keen to make a claim for compensation, we would always suggest that you report it to the relevant body, whether that's the council, um, Transport Scotland, or the the, the, the owners of the, the property. It's, it's worthwhile reporting that. And if you're not sure who to report it to, pick up the phone to us and we can let you know. Um, we're always happy to you know point you in the right direction if we can. So this is a case that we dealt with that's um, reported in the, it's, there was a judgment issued in this one because it went through a full court hearing. Um, so our, our client, um, David, um, he's an experienced road cyclist and he was out in a 65 mile morning ride and he was heading along the A701. And he was the lead cyclist in the group at the time and they were riding two abreast. And as they approached the, the bridge over bigger water, um, they had noticed grit on the left hand side. So he'd moved himself to the right to avoid the gravel on the road. Um, but suddenly without, and without any warning, his bike came to a stop and he describes it as his um, handlebars being ripped out of his hands. And he th was thrown over his handlebars and he dislocated his elbow and that required surgery. Um, and again, cyclists most, most concerned about their bikes as BMC street, street Racer was, uh, was damaged extensively and I think it was written off. So what has caused this accident is this strip, this metal strip um, that was on the carriageway. So, of course, it's quite clear to, to cyclists that this is going to cause a hazard. Um, and what we had to do was pursue a case against Scottish Borders Council, um, who are the local authority responsible for the roads, but they refused to admit responsibility and the case was raised at court. So during the court hearing, um, the solicitors for the council said that the metal strip didn't constitute a defect or anything that the council needed to do anything about. But we had to be able to prove on the balance of probability um, that it caused a hazard um, to cyclists because um, roads authority have duty to all roads uh, users, not just cars. Um, but what we, what we received um, was a, a successful judgment from the court who agreed with um, our, our arguments that it was in fact a hazard and it ought to have been apparent to the roads authority inspector um, because it had been there for plenty of time and it ought to have been apparent to our roads authority inspector with ordinary competence um, that it presented a hazard to road users and in particular cyclists. And I'm going to talk just a little bit, oh, this is coming up, poor quality photograph, but um, a little bit about diesel spills um, because a, a diesel um, spillage can cause a significant hazard for, um, for cyclists. Um, obviously the, on two wheels, there's not much contact with the ground. So if the, the ground is slippy, it's, it can be a, a real issue. Um, so again, this is a real life case that we dealt with. Um, our client was out for a cycle and he was traveling on Kilmalcolm Road in Port Glasgow. Um, so it's a rural road um, out in the middle of nowhere. Um, it's a single carriageway road and he's approaching this cattle grid. Um, but I hadn't actually got to it, but his bike went entirely from under, underneath him. And as he lay on the road, um, thinking about getting himself up, um, he realized that there'd been a diesel spill that had caused him to lose grip. So the police were calls, called to the, the scene of the accident and they closed the roads um, because it was so dangerous. And you can see that they've actually had to put um, down all the sand on the road um, to improve the situation, try and soak up some of the diesel. Um, they actually closed the roads so it can be cleared and whilst our client was taken off to hospital, um, a very helpful young policeman actually carried out full investigations and was able to track down the vehicle um, that had spilled the diesel. And this was primarily lucky because I think it was such a rural part of the world um, that there was, you know, everyone knows which cars are coming and going. And it was an agricultural vehicle um, that had used the road earlier in the day and had broken down and caused the diesel spill. So because this young copper was very proactive in tracking down the vehicle, um, we were able to intimate a claim against the insurers for the vehicle. 
because you are obliged to properly maintain your um, vehicle and not um, have it you know, sort of spilling diesel onto the road. However, if we weren't able to track down the vehicle that caused the diesel, diesel spill, there's still things that we can do in order to pursue a claim for our clients. Um, we can pursue a claim or we can make an application to the Motors Insurers Bureau, the MIB, um, which um, provides as a as a government, it's a body formed by statutes and it's funded by the insurance industry. And it provides compensation for those injured by um, untraced or uninsured drivers. So if there had been a vehicle spillage and nobody knew which vehicle it came from, that would be an untraced vehicle. Um, so the normal situation would be a hit and run type collision, um, but here it would be an untraced vehicle. And if there's a substantial spillage, even if we're not able to track down the vehicle that was responsible, we are still able to make a claim for some elements through the Motors and Sewers Bureau. So again, it's some, something that's worth contacting us to see if we can help with if you have been involved in an accident, even if you're not sure what vehicle was um, responsible for it. Um, just wanted to speak a little about the use of experts. So, you know, whilst, as I say, we're keen cyclists and we're experts in personal injury involving cyclists, cycling accidents, we do often instruct expert witnesses to provide evidence um, and opinion um, in cases and ultimately, if necessary, a court action to provide evidence there. So often we are instructing highways experts um, and uh, you know, road condition experts to provide evidence. And this is important because it's not for us to say what is reasonable um, for a council to do. We would need to provide um, evidence to the court through an expert um, as to what um, would be expected of a reasonable roads authority in the circumstances. So if it does happen to you, first of all, I hope it doesn't, um, and I hope you never have need to contact us, um, but um, get as much information as you can at the time for what is reasonable. Um, again, if, of course, if you're being carted off in an ambulance, it might not be an option for you, but if you can, get somebody else to take photographs, um, again, measurements or putting something that can be used for scale beside it, or even taking videos on your phone is really helpful. If anybody comes to your aid, try and get their details. Um, just a name and a phone number is really helpful. And if you have been involved in an accident involving a hazard, even if you don't intend to make a claim, it's worthwhile trying to report it um, to the relevant body. So hopefully it doesn't happen to somebody else. And again, if you're not sure who it is to um, report it to, then just you can by all means give us a buzz and we'll be happy to talk, talk you through it, um, even if you don't wish to make a claim. Um, happy to talk to you about your rights and you know what options you have um, but as I say it's really important that we do try and report these hazards to the roads authority so that they are aware and hopefully it doesn't happen to somebody else. Um, so again I'll take I'll go through the questions uh, any questions that we've received. Rod I don't know if we've received any. We had a few we have. We've had a few comments. You want to maybe deal oh. with them first, but we've got... Uh, um, well, yeah, I've had one sent in advance, which is always helpful. It gives me an opportunity to um, um, prepare. I'm afraid I don't know who asked it, so I hope they've, they've tuned in today. Um, so there's a question that um, was provided in advance. So what would happen if somebody uh, suffered an injury on a private road? Um, so we've talked a lot about sort of local authorities and roads authorities and how they have duties, um, but equally private owners um, also have duties to those entering their, their land under the Occupiers Liability Scotland Act 1960. Um, so private owners must show such care as in all the circumstances of the case is reasonable to see that a person will not suffer injury or damage by reason of any danger. Um, so it's entirely fact sensitive. So the, the, the real, uh, the real, the important word there is reasonable is what is reasonable in the circumstances. So again, it, it really depends on you know, what hazard and where and how often you're expecting people on your land. Um, so there is a specific question as part of that is if the cyclist did not have the prior consent of the road user, you, sorry, the road owner, that doesn't make any difference whether it was a trespasser 
or somebody that was invited onto the property, owners still have a duty to show reasonable care in the circumstances. Again, it's in the circumstances, but the law doesn't, um, in Scotland, it's different in England, but the law in Scotland doesn't uh, distinguish between trespassers and those with the legitimate or invited um, reason to be on the land. And um, the, the next part of that question was the cyclist using the private road with the owner's permission. So presumably somebody to bring you your Friday curry. Um, presumably that will be somebody coming up your driveway, um, you know, on the bike. Again, if you have an obvious hazard that you're aware of, um, you ought to do something about it, um, particularly uh, and perhaps more so for places where you're expecting um, people to be. So you might expect people um, to come up your driveway or walk up your path. So if you have a big hole there, then you might, you might want to think about doing something um, because you could be subject to a claim. Again, it's, it's so fact sensitive that it's difficult to give a sort of, um, you know, an overarching um, answer. Um, but it's, it's, as I say, the law says it's in, to sh you must show such care as in all the circumstances is reasonable. Right, if you give me two seconds, I'm just going to have a look at the questions. So I can only see one, is that right, Rod? Yeah, there's also been a, there's been a few comments to us during the presentation. Okay, well, I'll deal with, David's asked a question. Yeah. Um, and he said, I've got a car and motorcycle insurance, but I don't have bicycle insurance, should I get it? And the answer is entirely up to you, you're not obliged. Um, so for cars and motorcycles, you are obliged. There's obligatory um, duties to have insurance and that's third party fire and theft that you've got to have. And the important bits, third parties, if you cause hazard to somebody else. And there's there's good reason for, for having obligatory insurance and those, those or sort of compulsory insurance in those circumstances is because driving a car and uh, you know using a motorcycle is dangerous and you, you know you you pose quite a big danger to pedestrians and more vulnerable road users cyclists generally don't pose a lot of danger to other people and you know i suppose for that reason um there's not compulsory insurance there um, if you wanted to get insurance there's various organizations that you could join um, there's um, British Cycling, there's Cycling UK, I think if you were joining um, Triathlon Scotland or some of those other um, you know, sporting organisations, then public liability insurance is, is included in that. But you might also want to check your house insurance because you might be covered under that for, for public liability insurance. So again, if you want to get it, you can get it. Um, I only have it when I have British Cycling membership and I only have British Cycling membership when I actually race which is not very often um, so you know personally I don't always have it um, but I, I make the decision that I don't often pose any any particular harm um, or any hazard to to anyone else so um, I, don't, I don't think I need it um, all the time um, but again as I say it's, it's at your discretion. The advice um, definitely is to say check your household contents because people just yeah. perhaps do that do they? Uh, so is it in chat? There we go. Yeah, so, so Joseph oh, suggested that what three words is quite a good program yep. to use to locate the pothole, which of course it is. Yep, Joseph is my new best friend because I love what three words. I find it so helpful, um, especially when you're out in the middle of nowhere and somebody says, oh, the pot, there was a big massive pothole just beside that white house out past the Wiggly Roads over the bridge. And I don't know where it is, but if somebody can direct me to what three words, it's brilliant. Um, so if you don't know anything about that, have a look at it on Google. Um, it's a great website that divides the whole world up into, and I think it's three meter squares yeah. and gives it a three, um, three words reference. Um, so it's really handy for um, areas, you know, particularly out in the countryside or somewhere that there isn't necessarily a street address. Um, so it's a great, um, it's a great thing to use. You also mentioned yeah. that those reporting tools like fill that hole dot org yes. is mm -hmm. does have an app that you can put on your phone and the same as yep. fix my streets and both of those you can basically locate when you're on site uh, the pothole and upload it from that location assuming you've got coverage. Well, one of the things I sometimes do just because apparently um, this is <laughs> this is my life now, but if I take a, a I often take photographs of potholes and. I'll not deal with it at the time because um, if I'm out in the bike, I'll take a photograph. But then when I go back home, um, my phone 
locates where I've taken that photograph if you've got location services on. And so it's quite handy from that that I can then work out where the pothole was and then I can report it to the council because the Aberdeenshire Council must hate me with all the reports that I put in. Um, so Derek's asked, is it the same as the path to your front door? I'm assuming he's meaning an occupier's liability and the answer is yes. So watch out for your postie. Um, if you have a trap door in front of um, your, your, your um, you know, on your garden path, it's, uh, it's something you probably want to be aware of. Um, so again, it's in the circumstances. So you probably do expect somebody to come up to your front door to deliver your post, bring you your Friday curry or whatever. You probably don't expect somebody to be launching themselves across your back garden. So, you know, your, the amount of care you need to take there is, is perhaps different. Um, but um, yeah, it's, it's, as I say, it's the, the, what is reasonable in the circumstances um, to, to protect um, those on your land against hazards. Um, I should say for um, hazards, for example, if you're lucky enough to live by the sea, but, um, you know, perhaps by a cliff edge, you're not obliged to do anything about natural and obvious hazards. So you're not got to fence off the cliffs or anything like that. Um, but if, if there is um, a, you know, a, a hazard that isn't a natural and obvious hazard, um, then you are obliged to, to do something about it. You're obliged to do something reasonable about it. Um, the only other comment that Susie had made was to do with yeah. road bumps. Or yeah, so like Susie said bumps. some road humps can be pretty bad as well. Some in our area is pretty high. Is there anything that can, general to be done for, for cyclists to navigate road humps? Um, a lot of road humps are either sleeping policemen directly across, uh, you know, um, straight across the road and you've got no choice um, but to go over them. Um, or they have, and I'm, I'm sure there's a word for them, but I'm not sure what it is off the tip of my tongue, but the, the sort of squares where you can go around the left side or the right side. Um, often the left side, you know, beside the curb um, is filled with grits and glass and stuff you don't want to go into. Um, so I, I tend to go through the middle, but it's obviously not um you know it's, it's not ideal if there's traffic coming in the other the other way i suppose you know the, the main thing is obviously slow down for them uh, as much as you can particularly to protect your wheels more than anything else um but if there is one that's particularly um hazardous um and you know perhaps a particularly steep angle um compared to all other ones and report it to your council again um, if you report it to the Roads Authority, then it gives them the opportunity to do something about it, hopefully, before anyone has a hazard, um, has an accident on it. Um, I think the only other question was actually, uh, Joseph had asked whether the anti-skid surface that was in Edinburgh, which was at fault, had been replaced. And I think the answer to that question was yes, once the council realised they put the wrong surface down, they went back and repaired it properly and correctly. So yes, it was. They uninstalled the ice, the ice rink. <laughs> it did. Yeah. It did. Okay, well, I think that's it, Roz. Um, we'll have no further questions. Um, perhaps I can just thank you very much once again for your time and for sharing your knowledge. I hope everybody enjoyed that and a little bit more informed now than they were before. Can I also say that uh, next week at this time, we are going to be looking at, and Roz uh, talked about it earlier, the Motor Insurance Bureau and the two... Um, schemes they operate, the untraced driver scheme and the uninsured driver scheme. We're going to look into a number of cases. We've dealt with those and make you aware of how those operate and what the conditions are in relation to them. So same time next week, look back and uh, we'll look forward to seeing you then. Up to then. Yeah, thanks uh, all. Thanks Enjoy your evening. Your Enjoy your evening. Thank you.